हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम टू द नेशनल साइंस डे दिस इज वी आर कमिंग टू यू फ्रॉम आईसा पुणे आई एम अमृता हाजरा अ फैकल्टी मेंबर इन द डिपार्टमेंट्स ऑफ केमिस्ट्री एंड बायोलॉजी एंड आई एम गोन टेल यू अ लिटिल बिट अबाउट मिलेट्स टूडे आई स्टडी वाइटामिन बायोसिंथेसिस इन माई लैब एंड आई एम वेरी इंटरेस्टेड इन द जनरल न्यूट्रिशन uh because of my research um interest in vitamins and uh, you know consequently food i'm also very interested in uh, uh you know the role that food plays in our lives and i feel millets are a great topic to talk about in that regard on this occasion of national science day uh so uh, this is actually a very good time to talk about this because the un recently declared 2023 which is the next year as the international year of millets this is the headline from a newspaper article 3 uh, 4 days back so what it says is the un general assembly recently adopted a resolution sponsored by india and supported by more than 70 countries declaring 2023 as the international year of millets now why would you have an international year of millets and um the reason is something that they provide the resolution is intended to increase public awareness on the health benefits of millets and the suitability for cultivation under tough conditions marked by climate change now this is something that i feel is very relevant because millets are a very very hardy and climate smart grain and we don't eat enough of it so millets are good for the climate they are good for the soil they are good for us but we don't eat enough of it and hence i thought i'll give a talk today on uh uh you know why millets are what millets are and uh why should we be paying more attention to them both uh you know in our diet as well as trying to improve or increase production in the fields around us so what are millets uh millets are basically just cereals uh you know we know a whole variety of grains uh here is like you know some pictures uh, that a very nice illustrator uh, has made and you can see you know the ones that we recognize corn we recognize wheat we recognize rice of course we recognize oats such a thoda thoda abhi pata chal raha hai advertisement aata hai tv pe um barley you've heard you've heard about but then you come across some other grains which are less known there's something called quinoa there's something called rye there's something called sorghum uh these are these other grains that you see in the picture are the ones that um are Uh, not quinoa but sorghum and what is labeled as millet and what is lab- labeled as pro soap these three in this picture actually stand for uh, are, are representative of the group of grains that are called millets um now sorghum is just basically jowar pro soap is a type of millet uh, that is uh, you know also available here uh, with us in india um and what is funny is that there is one grain that they've actually just labeled as millet because there is such little awareness about what uh, millets are so i'm hoping to be able to clarify that this i i pulled out this picture because exactly of this reason that it's interesting that people label something as millet but it's unclear what exactly you know what are millets so uh, just uh, a picture this is you know uh, three different kinds of millet seeds that uh, you know i've worked with um this is proso millet finger millet which is nachni banyard millet which is varai proso is called china in uh, india okay so these are the uh, 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 you know a small uh, subset of the various millets that are available uh, in the market today so um, so still still what are what are these millets yes there are cereal grains there are multiple types of millets is what i've told you till now but what are they so millets are a kind of of course cereal grain but they are slightly different from rice and wheat uh they are more similar to plants like corn okay what is the difference uh so uh, jowar which is basically sorghum and which is also grouped with millets uh for all practical purposes they are c4 tropical type plants um and they are their their advantage over other uh, the other set of plants which are called c3 temperate type plants is that they are more efficient at utilizing the higher solar radiant energy in the tropical latitudes such as where we live such as you know uh, countries in africa um c4 plants are more efficient at surviving and 
being able to absorb the solar energy radiant uh, the radiant solar energy in those latitudes now i'll give you a very quick primer on what c3 and c4 mean so in c3 plants so we all know that plants are how do they make food they take the carbon dioxide that you know uh, organisms such as us humans breathe out they take that in that is their carbon source and uh, using the energy from the sun they fix the carbon dioxide to make carbon based carbohydrates and then they release oxygen in the process now in the process of fixing carbon dioxide is what is the, the process is called fixing carbon dioxide to be able to then make carbohydrates in that process of fixing carbon dioxide in c3 plants the carbon dioxide is fixed directly into what is called a mesophilic cell whereas in c4 plants uh, in the mesophilic cell there's an enzyme called rubisco which is what is responsible for fixing the carbon dioxide in c4 plants what interestingly happens is the mesophilic cell takes in the carbon dioxide and concentrates it as a carbon dioxide pump and then pumps that co2 near the rubisco enzyme now how does that help is because this is a less efficient way the c3 way of importing carbon dioxide to rubisco is a less efficient way of bringing in carbon dioxide because you're not concentrating it so you need a continuous supply this pore which is called the stomata is open and there's always a loss of water and there is a toxic there's some amount of oxygen that enters which needs to be pushed out etc etc and so this this uh, cavity from which the carbon dioxide enters is open for longer periods of time which is why when it is a hotter environment these plants don't do very well c3 plants don't do very well in higher temperatures c4 plants actually do quite well because their mechanism is to concentrate carbon dioxide so the stomatal pore can close or become smaller contract over time uh, when there is enough carbon dioxide that's concentrated and it leads to less wastage less um evaporation of water now why am i telling you about this difference between c3 and c4 plants is it tells you that certain plants are going to be better at withstanding climate change withstanding higher temperatures and c4 plants such as corn such as uh, millets are going to be better at climate change uh, at at uh, facing climate change than wheat and rice will be able to uh, with withstand okay so that is why millets are a very important part or a very important player in um the uh, in us to be able to combat climate change in the future so what constitutes a millet species so what are these millets now we've learned that they are cereal grains we've learned that they are c4 plants what makes up these millet species so uh, the name millet so first of all millets are small or tiny seeded grains so you can see from the picture that i've shown here that these are the panicles and you can see little 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 seeds on them and those are the millet grains the word millet is derived from the middle french word mill which means thousand which means that in your palm you can fit in a thousand seeds of millet that's where the name comes from now jawar which is not in this picture but you know how it is it's slightly larger as a grain uh sorghum and the millets uh, sorghum is jawar they are usually clubbed together when you're talking about uh, these grains because sorghum is also c4 and uh, they considered together because they have similar agronomic characteristics and they generally grow in the same geographical location they're used for similar applications and hence you always talk about jawar and millets in the same uh, conversation okay so that is what millets are let's look at it a little bit more scientifically so um just like you know this is a this is just a way in which we classify organisms um in uh, that are around us so you know there's something called a kingdom kingdom plantae which is basically uh, where you have uh, all the plants that we see around us and then you go through phylum class order etc as you narrow down and as you come to family you become even more narrower then you come to something called genus and then you come to species now how are millets related to other grains that we eat let's look at that so all the grains that we eat belong to the family poaceae uh you can see that at the sub family level the division starts so the the ones that we eat very commonly rice and wheat are the ones that make one branch of the sub family and in the panicoidi branch are where you have corn jawar and you start having some millets and in the other 
subfamily branch which is called chlorid chloridoidine you have some other millets okay uh, some other being finger millet is basically ragi or nachni that is a slightly separate branch teff is a, a very close relative of ragi which is uh, eaten in the ethiopian culture uh, and uh, so those are make a slightly different subfamily uh these grains are typically very rich in minerals for example ragi is very rich in calcium uh other than that these other small grains uh are uh, you know in the same family called adipoidy um if you also look at how the plants look uh for the various um, uh you know sub family uh, cereals rice and wheat we've seen they look this is rice this is wheat um you know they look like grasses um then corn actually looks there's a there's a stalk there's a strong stalk like thing and then there's the corn uh, that comes out of it so corn and sorghum which is basically jowar look very similar in how the plant uh, morphology looks and then other millets often look like what wheat or rice or barley would look like okay so the plant also looks different uh, but it's not that is not very nicely uh, divided as per the subfamilies but what we need to remember is corn and jowar have a very similar structure and the other millets look just like other grasses such as rice wheat etc look like in the field so um this is a question that i have always wondered about as a scientist so you know i study vitamin biosynthesis in my lab at isa pune i have studied vitamin biosynthesis during my phd and my postdoc and i've always encountered this question when i look at my food plate every day that if these vitamins which are micronutrients you need tiny amounts of these molecules to be able to keep your body healthy if i need a variety of these every day then how can i get them if i'm eating the same things over and over again and by what by what i mean by eating the same things is not so on this plate you know you think that there's a decent variety there's some you know um there's some uh, cauliflower some cabbage sabji then there is another rajma something ka sabji there's some uh, koshimbir uh, you know this is made up of yogurt and uh, uh, like a salad but what you notice is approximately up to you know 35 to 50% of this plate is rice and wheat chapati right the rest is there of course and which is great it's it's amazing that you know we eat this diversity of food in india but what still strikes me is that at least maybe you know 40 to 50% of your plate is made up of rice and wheat okay now imagine every day morning you are eating uh, you know chapati or bread or something which is made up of wheat afternoon you are eating some rice and roti or something that's again rice and wheat and evening again you are eating something like that you are eating even even if you eat something some variety right uh, you are still eating if you are eating pav bhaji you are still eating pav which has wheat in it okay so you are continuously around 40 to 50% of your everyday intake is the same set of grains and that is something that is a little um it's it's disturbing to me for the reason that i feel like we are missing out on eating a larger variety of micronutrients not only vitamins but also minerals like what i said if you had ragi instead you would have gotten a lot of calcium in one of your meals right uh we miss out on eating these nutrients if we are eating a plate that looks like this over and over again and i say this with caution because i do realize the beautiful variety that we get on the side but the cereal which makes up a large part of our diet is very similar on an everyday basis so today staple grains are uh, on our everyday plate are rice and wheat the consequences as i just discussed are of course this loss in food variety and consequently nutrients in our diet what happens in the field then because we are eating more rice and wheat uh, wheat uh, farmers are also growing more rice and wheat causing monocultures in the field uh, because there are monocultures the soil is getting depleted of the same nutrients over and over again and you know you're needing to give extra uh, irrigation extra fertilizers pesticides because you're growing the same thing over and over in that space not allowing the soil to regenerate not allowing the microorganisms to uh you know start to um uh, to be healthy because you're taking away the same set of things from the soil so having that said this uh even though we have healthier diets today i feel like we are losing out on the opportunity to make our um 
uh, our daily consumptions more not only um, very varied but also more tasty so if you you know this is what i showed you on a plate but if you just look at the uh, numbers for the world wheat corn and rice make up about 89% of the worldwide cereal production so this is from this is data up to 2014 you can see corn rice and wheat are the highest bars and then you have millet you have barley you have jowar which are much much smaller in number so 89% of worldwide cereal production is yet um rice wheat and corn so uh, what is interesting is that um even though india dominates millet production worldwide so if you look at where in the world uh, is millets produced uh, this is uh, data from 2019 it shows about 36% of all millets produced in the world is produced in india and then the next largest country that produces millets is niger and then you know other countries make up the rest so of course millets are the largest producer of millets is indeed india and you know this data is uh, uh, well illustrated in the newspaper this has been uh, this is a chart from the newspaper uh, in i think this is 2020 uh india has reached 38% of millet production uh and in india the leading state that is making say for example bajra is rajasthan so yes i mean there's a lot of uh uh you know um uh, millet activity happening in india but what i want you to note is even though we are the largest producer of millets in the total amount of food grains that we produce uh millets make up only about 10% of the production okay so 90% of the grains that we make and if you look at this if you know we were making a whole variety of um dals and uh, you know pulses and all i would be okay but we are still making a large amount of rice and wheat that's what we are growing in india over and over again and the amount of sejawar bajra the millets are at the most they make up about 10% of all the pulses that we produce in india so that is what i feel requires a change and the international year of millets is a way is a is a push for all of us to focus on that not only on our diets but also what is being produced in our countries what is being produced um in the fields and realize why it is important that we draw back the uh, spotlight on to millets so why is this spotlight on millets right yes i mean why do we need to draw back the spotlight so millets are naturally diverse okay so when i say millets as i told you they don't they are not one type of grain they are a large variety of small grain uh, cereals so today uh, there are about 10 commonly cultivated varieties worldwide and there are thousands and when i say thousands i i literally mean it i mean like hundreds of thousands of land bases and land bases means that these seeds when they have grown in a certain kind of land for a very long time they develop their own characteristics often they develop different colors they can develop develop different uh you know nutrition contents because they've been growing in that soil for a very long time, a period of time there are thousands of land races of millets all over india and all over the world in india today at least nine varieties of millets are cultivated uh as i've illustrated um millets are nutritious low carbohydrate content i'll i'll talk a little bit more about this as we go along uh they're gluten free now gluten free means that they don't they lack a protein which is present in um in wheat uh which is an allergen for certain people so they're gluten free uh as i've said they're drought tolerant they're c4 plants and they're uh, very good at resisting drought conditions which is lack of water for a certain period of time uh they are more reliable than most grains on poor soils they are able to grow on very arid soils uh they are staple foods in many parts of the world uh they have short crop cycle so seed to grain is often in 100 to 120 days at the most so it's a short crop cycle it's efficient to grow these millets on our soil and millets have a very large variety of uses they can be used as a cover crop they can be used for forage for uh animals and they can be used for consumption as you for humans as grain so why not millets why not why isn't the focus on millets is the question that i'd now like to pose given that they are such great 
grains for the uh, ecology for our health for uh, you know the agroecology uh, why not millets so uh, what so you know why are millets so much more nutritious i just thought you know showing a picture would help so this is a, a grain of wheat and uh, generally a grain will have three main components one is called the bran one is called the germ and one is called the endosperm the endosperm is where all the starch of the grain resides now the bran and the germ are what uh, have a lot of the nutrients the other micronutrients such as vitamins such as oils such as um, uh, you know minerals these are present in the bran and the germ the endosperm is generally the starchy part of the grain in wheat because of the structure of how it is it is easy enough to strip off the brain and the germ so that you can only get the endosperm and what maida or all purpose flour is is that it is only the endosperm of the grain um now um that tells you that you can separate the components easily and i do want you all to note one thing that as compared to a whole wheat flour that you would have at your home maida has a much longer shelf life so it can stay for much longer without getting spoiled and that's because it doesn't contain the other complex parts from the germ and the bran it is purely starch or mostly starch and hence it um starch and of course the protein that is assimilated and so um uh, the shelf life increases if you are just being able to pull out the starch in the case of millets the bran the germ and the endosperm are integrated in a tighter way than what is uh, in the case of wheat or in the case of rice and hence it is difficult to remove it is i mean people are still being able to remove the bran layer entirely etc but in traditional practices of uh, you know uh, milling millets um it's difficult to uh, take away all the parts that easily and hence uh, millets are generally eaten more as a whole grain and whole grains are more nutritious because along with the starch you are also getting the oils the micronutrients that are present in the bran and the germ layer and so millets are consumed as whole grain which is good for us if you look at the just you know the the parameters that we usually look out look look for for uh, millets and for other uh, cereals the carbohydrate content of a general millet of course there are so many kinds of millets but i've just taken some one of them is generally lower as compared to the fiber content that the millet has okay so if you do a ratio of the carbohydrate to fiber it's a low ratio which tells you that you are getting more fiber per carbohydrate that you are eating along with that millets also have a decent amount of proteins and iron calcium as i was saying etc and so uh, millets have a great nutrient and micronutrient portfolio and so it's a good idea to think about incorporating these grains into our diet for the reason of our own health as i just said millets uh, are drought tolerant their climate smart grains and there are lots of articles really good articles i've just pulled out a few on the slide which you can go back and refer to but uh, if we sat uh, then uh, you know journal articles frontiers in plant science UN, un global perspectives etc all are declaring how millets prove tasty solution to climate and food security challenges etc so millets are climate smart grains they are really good and hence we need to draw the spotlight on millets um as soon as we can um uh, you know given that the next year is going to be when the whole world is going to be looking at these grains so i'll tell you about this very quick uh, um experiment or um i'll i'll briefly tell you about this experiment that we did uh, to test really whether millets um are you know how good are they do they really require less water what happens so this is an experiment that i did as a postdoctoral researcher when i was at the university of california at berkeley we called it the millet project we had received funding from the university to do it uh, what we did was we had five rows in which we planted four types of millets i'll tell you what we did so there are five rows they are 200 feet each in the front part of each row we planted foxtail millet next one we had planted pearl or bajra millet third we had planted proso millet and fourth patch we 
planted Japanese millet. So each row has each of these four millets in them. Okay, so the first is foxtail, next is pearl, third is proso, four is Japanese. In the first row, we had five rows of this, right? In the first row, we only watered it till the plant sprouted and then we stopped watering, mimicking what would happen in a drought condition. In the second row, we uh, watered it about six times in a month. So very little water as compared to what you would give for growing corn, which is a similar C4 plant. So uh, only six times in 38 days and then there was no water in the second row. In rows 3, 4 and 5, we gave it a full water regime like you would give corn, which is another C4 plant, right? Now, what we observed, so we had to cover the rows um, like this because the birds used to come and eat the millets. Birds really like millets as food. So we had to cover the rows while the plants were growing and then we had to put a net to make sure that the birds would not enter and eat the seedlings, etc. But at the end of the experiment, what we observed was except that first row, which was completely droughted, there was only, you know, two types of two times we had given water in the whole growth regime of 100 days everything else seemed to grow to a similar height and you know have have a decent amount of this uh, you know um, millet year or millet panicle as it's called so uh, you know uh, that some of so in this case in the previous slide bajra is what i'm showing you here bajra showed this difference in height for that completely droughted condition versus um, you know, where it had received some water or regular water. Uh, but, you know, some experiments didn't work at all. For example, proso millet, uh, none of the three rows grew. And this can be because, you know, you're trying to grow a millet in a different environment. Uh, this millet is not probably suited to that environment. So it's not like millets will always grow anywhere. But, uh, you know, millets are pretty good at uh, growing. And so of the four millets that we experimented with, three of them did grow and showed us interesting results. Here I'm just showing you some very, uh, uh, some, you know, representative data. Uh, in Japanese millet, which was the last part of our rows, um, uh, the, in the droughted condition, reduced water and full water condition, there was hardly any difference in the length, the height of the plant. Pearl millet, the droughted rows were shorter, but the other rows were uh, pretty good. Uh, importantly, the year weight, the millet year, uh, which is the, the panicle, in the droughted conditions in Japanese millet were small, but under reduced water and full conditions, they were very similar. Whereas in pearl millet, they were almost, you know, equivalent to each other, uh, the year weight. So it tells you that less water, basically these two conditions, the red bar and the yellow bar, uh, are okay. It's Millets can grow under really less water. Um, and that means that they are really good at, uh, you know, um, surviving under drought conditions, which is what are the claims that are made in many uh, occasions when millets are discussed. So this is our own experiment, uh, unpublished data from 2015, of course. But um, uh, I hope I conveyed to you that indeed these are climate smart, drought friendly grains. So um, this brings me to the last part of our talk that yes, so now we, we I think we are all happy with the idea that yes we should be eating millets it's a good idea uh, it uh, you know they they bring a lot to ourselves our environment uh, why and how should we eat millet given that this is how our plates look like today which is about 35 to 50 percent of your meal is made up of a particular cereal grain which happens to be rice or wheat um, the problems for us if we eat the same things over and over again are food deficiencies uh, we are not getting all the nutrients that we could Allergies such as gluten intolerance, etc., which are arising because we are eating too much of wheat sometimes. Uh, lifestyle diseases because, uh, you know, you're eating refined grains. When you eat maida, when you eat polished rice, you're removing all the other fiber, you're removing the vitamins, you're removing the oils, the, the good stuff which is there in the grain, and you're only eating starch. And this is linked directly to lifestyle diseases that we have today, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, etc., the problems for the environment are that uh, we are causing more and more monocultures in the soils and we are using more water, pesticides, fertilizers and farmers are relying on these external inputs over and over again because we are demanding to eat more of the same thing which is bad for us, which is bad for them. So how and how should we eat more millets? Um, given that we now realize that there is a 
there's, there's, there's really a great importance for variety in our diet to eat a lot of grains. So I'm just going to leave you with a few suggestions of what one can eat. How should we eat millets? Traditional recipes include bhakris, which is what you see here. They are hand-pressed rotis. Because there's no gluten, you can't be rolling. You can't be making them with a rolling pan. But hand-pressed rotis, bhakris, these are more difficult to make. But they are one way to eat them. Millet upmas, uh, khichdis, etc. which are uh, easy to make instead of rice. You just use uh, millets. Uh, millet, malted millet porridges, which are really good for babies. Um, I have a child and... Um, I, I wish I was giving more millet to him. He just refuses to eat anyway. But uh, this is really good for kids. Millet idlis, fermenting millet and making idlis and dosas. Ragi uh, or nachni uh, muddes, which is these balls of ragi which are eaten with uh, uh, you know, a side. And popped millets. Instead of popcorn, you could also eat popped millets. Okay, So these are some of the ways. Laddus are other ways of eating um, millets in today's uh, in our life. So there's already a decent variety. But because millets are slowly coming back into our vocabulary, younger people, entrepreneurs have started coming up with innovative ways of eating millets. There are millet cookies in the market, biscuits in the market. You could be baking them for yourselves. Um, breads, which are made with millets. A very close friend of mine who runs a bakery called The Good Butter Bakery, uh, she makes uh, breads which, are in, which incorporate a lot of millets in them. In this case, there's ragi in her bread. Um, People are brewing beers with millets and here is uh, another local company in Pune called the Great State Ale Works, which is brewing uh, beers uh, with uh, bajra in this case. And malted millet powders are available which you can mix into your milk or your uh, and have like instead of colics or instead of something, some other health drink, you can have millet malts as a part of your, uh, you know, routine in the day. So these are easy ways to incorporate millets in our diet. Um, I'm going to leave you with the opinions of two people, the two practitioners that I just talked about, who are actually using millets in their food. And let's see um, what they uh, say. Uh, just before that, I wanted to make a note that mass scale productions of wheat and rice have made it cheaper, which is why we are more drawn to eating these. Let's make that change uh, as soon as we can. Um, Maida and polished rice have long shelf lives, which is why, again, they are more popular as ingredients in our pantries. But now that we know that it is important to also eat millets, along with the rice that we eat and along with the maida, along with the rotis that we eat, let us also start eating millets. And of course, wheat and rice are very versatile as ingredients. We can make a whole variety of things in our everyday lives with it. Let's start to incorporate millets in our diet. So um, I just wanted to end with this uh, a perspective of a baker who is actually using millet in her everyday work. Uh, this is Smita Sharan. She's a co-founder of the Good Butter Bakery. Uh, she says that the gluten network that wheat is capable of providing, uh, just when you combine it with water, uh, makes it such a great ingredient to work with. It has a clean flavor, etc. But she feels that incorporating millets in a combination with the wheat flour is the best way to get uh, is is a way to get best of both worlds and i really like that idea that you know you use wheat of course because it's a great ingredient but you also use millets so you get the goodness of millets as well as the advantages of wheat uh, she also says that it's easier to use millet flours and cakes and cookies because they have a unique flavor um, samir soni who's the brewer at the great state ale works which is uh, right here in pune uh, leading the Millet Beer Project, along with Nakul Ghosle, who is the founder of uh, Great State Ale Works, says that unavailability of millet malt makes it necessary to use unmalted millet grains for brewing. So they've even figured out technology that allows them to use unmalted grains, unmalted bajra for brewing their beers. So uh, given that people are young people, young entrepreneurs, uh, you know, a lot, lot of people around us are already aware of how cool millets are, how versatile they are as ingredients. I think it's a great time for us, now that we know the science, now that we know how to eat them, to start putting more of these excellent grains into our diet and into the fields around us. With that, I would like to uh, end this talk and thank you all for listening and um, hopefully starting to eat millets from your next meal.